Welcome to EPG Patishala. I am Dr. T. Uma Joseph from St. Francis College for Women and I am going to speak today on the movement for women's rights in women and history. In today's lesson, we are basically going to discuss about the movement for women's rights. But it is interesting to study about some of the things that took place in India and how the whole face of Indian history is distributed. In fact, when we look at ancient India, we call it as the Hindu period because most of the kingdoms in India were ruled by Hindu rulers. When we move to the medieval period, we call it as the Muslim period because most of the rulers were Muslims. Now, when we talk of modern India, we call that period as the British period. And it is during this time that most of the scholars, especially the European scholars, agree that there was great civilization that began in India because they felt that it was their burden to bring civilization into India. But if you really look at the history of India, throughout Indian history, there was so much of knowledge that was disseminated. There was so much of learning that was there in India. But which were the classes of people who benefited from this learning? That is the question that we are asking today. The, as far as education is concerned, as far as learning is concerned, as far as discoveries were concerned, they were not enjoyed by all sections in the society. There were only certain groups of people who had monopoly over all these areas. One of the areas that was grossly neglected in India was the area of education and especially the education of women. And therefore, even the question of emancipation of women was definitely delayed as a result of this. We call this period in modern India as the period of political consciousness because it was during this time that a few years earlier, the British had introduced English education in India. The English education united all the Indians in India. In fact, before the English education was introduced, the national consciousness was very difficult because everyone was conversing in their own language. But English education bound them together. It not only bound them together, it not only made them understand what was Western education, it also highlighted the condition in which they were. They were able to understand the exploitation of the British rule in India. It was only when they began to realize the nature of the British exploitation in India that they were able to take up their cause against it. It is during this time that what was most heartening was the role of the women in this situation. The women were also educated. The women also began to understand their rights. And it was then that they started the movement for equal rights with men and also emancipation in every field. So today's lesson will cover especially about the, the different activities that were taken, the campaigns that were taken in order to provide for rights for the women, to provide them franchise and to give them education and ultimately to make them leaders in India. Modern Indian history is often referred to as British India. The reason being that Britishers were ruling over India during this time. But modern Indian history is also a period of national consciousness. It was a time when the national sentiments of India grew and they became aware of the exploitation of them by the Britishers. And it was because of this that they made efforts to overthrow the British from India. This rise of national sentiments had many facets. But the most noteworthy among them was the movement for the emancipation of women and for the women to become aware of their position in the 19th century. They began to organize movements to fight for their own rights. In fact, it was in 1910 that women fought more vigorously to launch movements in India. And what were the women fighting for? 
they were fighting for issues like right to property right to education equality before law right to franchise and other related issues you will be happy to know that the movement for women's right was started first by progressive men of the 19th century they were the ones who were already educated they were the ones who understood the differences that were there in the society and looking and they were so deeply moved by the condition of the women in the society that they decided that they would work for the improvement of the condition of women in society note worthy among them were great reformers like raja ram mohan roy ishwar chandra vidyasagar jyoti bafule and mg ranade by the end of 1910 women in india were not just talking merely about eradication of social evils that were related to women in society but they were demanding equality with men in every sphere and in this they received support from none other than the father of the nation mahatma gandhi mahatma gandhi made it very clear that the status of women in a society is a proper measuring rod of the civilization of any society and so he brought about a number of social reforms and social programs to initiate this emancipation of women in india he in fact mahatma gandhi disliked evils such as parda illiteracy polygamy unequal marriage dowry system child marriage and treatment of widows the treatment for franchise that is the right to vote was made in the second decade of the 20th century by women of the elite class because it was these women of the upper classes in the society who had the right to education and who also were able to understand the differences that were there in the society when they became conscious of their political rights they were also influenced by the democratic values and ideals of that time but in this effort they got support from the british suffragettes dorothy jinraj dasa annie besant margaret cousins and sarojini naidu all of them who were educated they were working in order to create political consciousness among women as far as india's movement for emancipation of women was concerned though the men initiated it the women joined them soon the efforts of these men were first directed towards abolishing some of the social evils that were there in the society like sati the custom of child marriage abolishing the disfiguring of widows banning the marriage of upper caste widows promoting women's education obtaining legal rights for women to own property and requiring the law to acknowledge women's status by granting them basic rights in matters such as adoption the british also introduced the provision for the restitution of conjugal rights as far as the indian women's movement in india is concerned it was basically in two phases in the first phase they stressed basically and mainly on education and social reform but if you look at the second phase which was in the early years of the 20th century you will realize that it was more political and feminist these women were drawn from different spheres of life and one of the first step that they took was to receive education and education led them to employment and that led to their political participation and ultimately it led them to become great leaders in the political movement in india let's look for some time at the struggle for women's education in india definitely education has been accepted and identified as the major instrument for raising the status of women and education was started in the british period 
द क्रिस्टियन मिशनरीज टूक अलॉट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट इन द एजुकेशन ऑफ गर्ल्स इन फैक्ट एज अर्ली एज एटीन टेन अ स्कूल वॉज स्टार्टड बाई द क्रिस्टन मिशनरीज इन बेंगाल वन ऑफ द फर्स्ट बुक्स दैट वॉज रिटन रिगार्डिंग वीमेंस एजुकेशन वॉज बाई गुरु मोहन विद्यालंकर इन एटीन नाइनटीन बाई एटीन ट्वेंटी सेवन देर वो एटलीस्ट ट्वेल्व गर्ल्स स्कूल्स इन द हुगली डिस्ट्रिक्ट वीमेंस एम्प्लॉयमेंट एंड एजुकेशन वॉज अक्नोलेज इन एटीन It was during this time that the Woods Dispatch came to India and the Woods Dispatch which was a commission was sent to India only to study the implementation of the education policy in India and what was heartening was that the Woods Woods Dispatch also acknowledged that education was essentially needed even for women you will see that after this there was great progress in female education but the education was privately focused at the primary school level the next commission that came to india was the hunter commission as far as the field of education is concerned the hunter commission also emphasized the need for female education that the commission came in the year 1881 in 1857 three universities were established in india that was madras Bombay and Calcutta but what was so disheartening was that these universities did not permit the girls to be graduated from their universities it was only as late as 1875 that permission was given to them after 1882 girls were allowed to even go for higher education when the christian missionaries opened up the schools for the girls in bengal many of the hindu upper caste hindus especially the brahmins they felt that that was one way in which these christian missionaries were trying to convert the hindu population in india and therefore they started other schools called the kanya patashala these were exclusively for the girls because they felt that this would prevent the religious conversions that may be initiated in the schools started by the christian missionaries in the first half of the 19th century girls from poorer families studied in the christian missionary schools but later on you will see that different groups of students joined these schools and if you look at the kanya patashala most of the students from the upper caste hindus were part of these schools in fact one of the first attempts made in order to bring about education in women which would help their emancipation was the efforts that were made by the brahma samaj a ladies association was also started during this time in 1886 by swarna kumari devi her whole object was promoting friendly relation and spirit of service among the indian women her argument was that if women were educated and if women could join together they would be a great force to reckon with another effort was also made by pandita rama bai she founded the sharada sadan and the sharada sadan was to provide education and employment for women but the bigger effort came when women joined together in 1908 when a ladies congress was held in madras in which women from south india participated and what was very heartening was that 19 papers were read in tamil telugu malayalam marathi and english another great social reformer who worked tirelessly for the cause of women and their education was ishwar chandra vidya sagar his main effort was to uplift their status he pleaded for education for women in india and it was because of his efforts that widow remarriage act of 1856 could be passed he was able to get widows who were as young as even 8 or 9 years old they were branded as widows for life 
but he was able to get them educated and ultimately even see that they were married yet another woman writer was savitri bai phule she was a great poet an activist and she was a scholar from the western state of maharashtra she was the first woman teacher from modern maharashtra and she started also the first school for women in the year 1848 maharishi karve also took up the problem of widow remarriage and the education of women in maharashtra and it was he who established the sntt women's university of maharashtra in 1916 another practice that had to be dealt with was sati and the one of the great social reformers raja ramohan roy he decided the best way to spread the news about the practice of sati and how to ban it was to have write extensively and then to disseminate knowledge everywhere so in his book raja ramohan roy tries to prove that no religious texts of hindus warrant that a widow should become sati his book was criticized by more than 128 pundits in a declaration which said that the arguments of roy were wrong and he cannot be treated even as a representative of hindu ideology in 1817 vidya lanka declared in the supreme court that there is no textual rationality of sati and when lord william bentinck became the governor general he passed the sati prohibition act in 1829 this declared that making a hindu widow sati is illegal and criminal offence and is punishable in criminal courts this was definitely due to the great efforts that were made by raja ram mohan roy through his writings another issue about women that we would like to discuss is the right to franchise the right to vote for women was raised as early as 1917 when a women's delegation met mr montag and chemsford montag was the secretary of state for india and he came to india to meet with different groups in india and then to bring out a regulation which later came to be known as the government of india act 1919 but when these women presented their ideas before him for franchise for women he derided this idea and he did not even mention it in his report but the subsequent south borough franchise report that was prepared it went a step further and it rejected it saying that the franchise for women was impracticable in 1929 the viceroy announced a round table conference to discuss the indian demands for total freedom the all india women's conference they proposed a three women delegation to attend this conference and to put forward again this policy of adult suffrage to the conference but the british government rejected this delegation even the congress and the muslim league supported women suffrage in 1918 when mr montag visited india the delegation was led by mrs sarojini naidu it also included mrs anni besant and they wanted at least more schools and colleges to be open for women even in the indian national congress that was held in bombay in september 1918 a special resolution was taken in favor of women's suffrage and it was passed with 3/4 majority in the same month the muslim league which represents a certain section of muslims followed suit by a resolution in favor of franchise for indian women the arguments of the committee that rejected women's franchise was this they said first that it was impracticable to have women's franchise at this state they also said that none of the local governments advised the extension of franchise so there was no support from local governments also they also said that the fact that municipal franchise was extended and the response to it was so poor because there were only sparingly uh, few people came to participate in the franchise showed that women were not ready for franchise they also 
mention the social conditions, especially illiteracy that was rampant among the women. They also spoke about the seclusion of women thus far in Indian history. And they spoke about the conservative nature of the country. In 1919, when the Government of India Act was passed, it left totally the question of women's suffrage. And it said that hereafter, the provincial legislatures would have to decide about it and they would have to take it case by case by oath. Even in the six governor's provinces, the proportion of female electors to adult female population was only 6%. So the total number that was enfranchised was 268,000 only. In 1923, women for the first time voted for the provincial legislative councils and also for the central legislative assembly. On an average, less than 10% of the women electors actually went to polls. In 1926, they went for polls the second time and the average was a little higher. It was 13% at that time. In all these elections, women from six provinces voted and the percentage of women who went to the polls was disappointingly low. And therefore, for the critics who were against women's franchise, they would often quote these statistics to show that women were not really ready for franchise. In 1926, women for the first time were eligible to become members of the council. In 1926, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay became the first woman to run for a legislative state a seat in India. There was so much opposition to it. And according to reports, she lost that elections by just mere 55 votes. In 1935, the Government of India Act expanded political representatives of women in India. And 56 women managed to enter into the United Provinces Cabinet. Mrs. Naidu made a very remarkable statement about women's emancipation in her speech to the Bombay Presidency Women's Council on February 6, 1940. She said that the women of India have realized that civilization can be built only in comradeship with men and not in competition with them. I am sure that represents the view of women's organizations all over India. What happened after independence? With independence, as a result of Articles 15 and 16 of the Constitution, they were guaranteed the right to vote and no discrimination could be shown on the grounds of sex or religion or race or caste or place of birth. And equal op opportunities would be given to everyone as far as employment was concerned. Let's look briefly at the ideology of Congress and Gandhi. Gandhi very openly supported the cause of women and the status of women in society and for its improvement. The Gandhian ideology of forming self-help groups became popular during the freedom struggle. All these things helped the women to come out of their homes and to participate in large numbers in the movement. In fact, one of the mass movements that took place in India was a civil disobedience movement. In that Mahatma Gandhi wrote, The women in India tore down the parda and came forward to work for the nation. They saw that the country demanded something more than their looking after their homes. So even the Congress in 1928 proposed adult franchise and also the principle of sexual equality but this was adopted in 1931. Let's move on to modern India. The issues of rights of women were taken up by conscientious men. But later, the women came up and took up leadership on their own. So we can conclude by saying, though the initiative was taken by the men in order to see that women were emancipated, once the women were educated, they did not look behind. They moved forward step by step. They first were educated and then they participated in political uh, activities and then they emerged as leaders. And for all these 
they were uh, adequately supported by leaders and even prominent leaders they became active women became active they fought for their rights and after independence the greatest protector of the indian women's rights is the indian constitution it ensured that sexual equality by article 15 and 16 as a result of which women enjoy all kinds of equality including right to franchise in the indian constitution therefore the women have come a long distance now from where they started in spite of a lot of limitations in spite of situations in spite of circumstances that were against them with the help of the reformers with the help of political leaders with the initiative that was taken by the educated women in the society the women were able to rise from the position that they were in and they were just not aware of their rights they began to exercise their rights and this became a dream that was fulfilled in free india thank you